Hello and welcome to my presentation on momentum. We'll be looking at basic definitions, but more importantly, at some past exam questions. It's best to remember momentum as a simple, straightforward definition. Momentum is mass times velocity, and its units here are kilogram meters s to the minus one. And as I say, since velocity is a vector, momentum too is a vector quantity. And if we look at Newton's second law, F equals ma, a acceleration is V minus u over t. So F equals m into V minus u over t. Let's rearrange that. And F times t equals mv minus mu. And this is also known as impulse. And a couple of things to bear in mind here. mv is the final momentum. V is the final velocity, so mv is the final momentum. mu, u is the initial velocity, so mu is the initial momentum. So, a little bit of rearrangement. Force times time equals delta mv. Delta, of course, means just a change in, a change in momentum, and that equals delta p. And p is a symbol that's very often used for momentum in physics. Now, just look at this. We said that the units for momentum are kilogram meters per second. Well, same for the um, you, for, for the bottom line here, change in momentum. Kilogram meters per second, or is it? Well, that's equivalent to, right down on the bottom line, that's equivalent to F times T. And the units for that would be Newton seconds. So we'd have two equivalent units for momentum, two different units, and we'll see how we use those as we go along. Now, the law of conservation of momentum is stated here, and you can read that for yourselves. An explosion is just like a collision in reverse. And remember that this only applies when we have an isolated system, i.e. one in which no external forces act. It's also worth mentioning um, elastic and inelastic collisions. If I drop a ball vertically and it rises on the rebound to the same height I dropped it from, then the kinetic energy after impact will be equal to the kinetic energy just before impact. This would be an elastic collision. In reality, most collisions are inelastic with some kinetic energy being converted into sound energy, heat energy, etc. Now, my little example here, a boy of mass 50 kilograms and a horizontal velocity of two meters per second jumps onto a stationary skateboard. I hope you appreciate this hastily improvised skateboard here. Uh, we're asked to use the law of conservation of momentum to calculate the subsequent combined velocity, V, of the boy and the skateboard together as one combined mass, if you like. Now it's very useful in questions like this to take some direction as being positive. Remember we said that momentum was a vector quantity. I've taken left to right as being the direction for anything that has positive momentum. I'm applying the law of conservation of momentum. Uh, total momentum before equals total momentum after. And I've got 50 times two plus zero. Why zero? Well, the skateboard isn't moving, so it has zero velocity and zero momentum equals 53, that's the combined mass, times V, whatever that is. And you'll see, and you can check this for yourself, that we can work out that combined velocity, and it works out to be about 1.9 meters per second. Okay, now here we've got two ice hockey players, and different masses moving together. You can see that on the left hand side, on the right hand side, they've combined together, they've come entangled, uh, somehow managed to stay on their feet and move off to the right at a velocity V. And the question is, what is that velocity V, the velocity that they move off together at? Again, useful to think of uh, one direction as being that for positive momentum, 
of taking that again from left to right. We don't necessarily need to do that. Sometimes it could be from right to left. But I think it's just a little bit more convenient here. Now, if we're answering a question, let's write down the law of conservation of momentum. And there it is. And I've got 80 times three, that's positive momentum going to the right. And I've got minus 100 times five. Oh, why is it minus 100, I ask? Because of course, this player is going from right to left. So it has a negative velocity and a negative momentum equals 180 times v. Just look at the maths and v works out to be minus 1.4 meters per second. So they have a combined velocity of 1.5 meters per second, actually to the left. That's what the minus sign tells us and the diagram was really an attempt to trick you. So that's it. Very simple and straightforward couple of questions. Let's look at some past exam questions. Let's read through the question. Again, I'm going to suggest you take any uh, momentum of anything moving from left to right as being positive. So the initial velocity, the initial momentum of the ball is positive as it moves towards the post. We're asked to calculate its momentum. Oh, momentum is just mass times velocity. And don't forget the units. Part B moves in the opposite direction. Ah, a negative momentum. So I hope you got the same answers. Now no, notice I also said uh, for the first one, we could have had units of newton seconds, as I discussed earlier. And for part B, momentum is minus 8.4 kilogram meters per second or newton seconds. Okay, let's go on with this same question. The ball remains in contact with the post as it deforms, the ball deforms. I don't suppose the post is deforming much. Uh, for 0.22 seconds, determine the average force exerted on the ball due to the collision. Well, do you remember that equation for impulse? Yeah. Force times time equals change in momentum, mv minus mu. Okay. So there we have my basic equation. It's always helpful to put down the equation that you're going to use first. And the final momentum is the minus 8.4. And we've got minus the initial momentum, so minus brackets 11.3. And that together gives 19.7. So F times 0.22 is minus 19.7. So the average force is 89.5 newtons. Now the minus sign tells us something about the direction and we can use a bit of common sense to realize that, that this force is to the left. This is the force on the ball because of course the ball is going in that direction. The force on the post will of course be in the opposite direction and we could draw that in the diagram, although I haven't done so here. Here's another past exam question. A stationary radium nucleus decays by emitting an alpha particle. The speed of the recoiling nucleus is small compared to the speed of the alpha particle. Explain why the nucleus recoils and why its speed is small compared to that of the alpha particle. Well, the radium nucleus has much more mass than the alpha particle with its two protons and two neutrons. So how can we tackle this question? We're given four marks available. Uh, what are we expected to say? Well, I think you know perhaps intuitively what we might be expected to say, but let's do it anyway. I've shown my little diagram. I've got 
the alpha, it's the alpha particle moving off to the left, the nucleus recoiling to the right, Vn, that's the velocity of the nucleus. Now, the initial momentum before the decay is zero. From the law of conservation of momentum, the total momentum after decay would also be zero. Now, that would mean that M, we take right to left as being positive, Mn times Vn minus M alpha times V alpha equals zero. Now, a simple rearrangement of that leads to the equation I've got below. I've said also the alpha particle and the nucleus must have equal but opposite momentum. That follows from what we've just said. Momentum is a vector quantity. They move in opposite directions. And of course, the alpha particle has a small mass. The nucleus, the radium nucleus, has a large mass. So on the left hand side, we've got a small mass, large velocity. On the right hand side, we've got a large mass and a small velocity. So Vn would of necessity be smaller than V alpha. Okay, now let's look at this. The law of conservation of momentum can be investigated using a low friction track with two gliders. One is stationary, one is given a gentle push. They stick together and move off. We haven't seen the question yet. We've got a diagram. We haven't seen much of the question, except that it says, describe how you would use the apparatus to verify the law of conservation of momentum. Now, hold on. The first thing I did before I even looked at the question was to annotate the diagram. So I've got glider A, I've called that M1, with a velocity V1. When they come together, glider M2 has a mass M2. They will join together and their combined mass will, of course, be M1 plus M2 moving at a velocity V2. OK, now hopefully you've seen one of these low friction linear air tracks in which the metal gliders float on a cushion of air, uh, a bit like an air puck. Hopefully you've also uh, met light gates in which the blocking of an infrared beam by a card starts a timer attached to a computer, of course, and the switching on again of the infrared beam when the card has passed through stops the timer. And we're going to be saying something about that in this answer. So let's go into a little bit more detail. So what do we need to do? We need to measure the mass of each glider, and we do that on uh, a, a balance in the uh, electronic balance in the uh, lab. Measure the length of the card. The card takes a certain time to pass through the light gate, and for the card, velocity equals distance over time. So from that, we can work out the velocity. Well, actually, the computer will give us that. That's the um, reasoning behind that. We need to verify that the total momentum before equals the total momentum after. M1 V1 equals brackets M1 plus M2, close brackets, times V2. So we're explaining things clearly. And really, we need to show that the left hand side of the equation is equal to the right hand side within the limits of experimental uncertainty to verify the law of conservation of momentum. And I hope you heard my air quotes there. I hesitate to use the word verify because according to Karl Popper, the famous philosopher of science, we cannot verify scientific laws, we can only falsify them. But I'm moving away from the physics uh, specification on this particular point. Here is another question which involves bumper cars. 
I remember them being called dodging cars at fun fairs when I was a kid. And we can see a read, I hope, what's happening. One car, total mass of 300 kilograms, seven meters per second going from left to right. Yeah, let's take that left to right direction as having positive momentum. It hits this stationary bumper car and they move off together or asked to calculate the combined velocity after the collision. Well, that looks um, similar to some of the other questions we've had before, but then we're asked, after traveling 1.3 meters, the cars come to rest. Calculate the magnitude of the frictional force between the cars and the floor. Okay, this could be a little bit trickier. But then part B, we're asked to state one assumption. Well, could that relate to the law of conservation of momentum and the proviso that we talked about earlier? Yes, I think it certainly could. So you might like to pause for a moment and look at this question and see if you can come up with your own answers. Now, were your answers in agreement with mine? I certainly hope so. A part one, the total momentum before equals the total momentum after. And in an exam question, yeah, do write it down. So I've got 300 times seven equals 550 times V. 550, of course, is the combined mass and V is the velocity after the collision. And that works out to be about 3.8 ms to the minus one. Now, I decided to use v squared equals u squared plus 2as for part two to work out the acceleration. Well, actually, it's a deceleration um, because this, uh, this combined mass of uh, dodgem cars is coming to a rest and I get the acceleration is minus 5.6. Of course, it's a deceleration. Then using F equals MA, I get that the force is about 3.1 times 10 to the three newtons, 3.1 kilonewtons. Well, that's one way of doing it. But very often in physics, uh, there's, as my old grandmother used to say, there's more than one Way to skin a cat. Actually, she didn't skin any cats, but in physics, let's do this another way. Well, the combined Dodgem cars are, they have a particular kinetic energy which is dissipated due to friction as they come to a rest. Now, what's the work done in coming to rest? That's a force times distance. Well, that must equal the kinetic energy dissipated. Remember, force times distance, work done, joules. That's the left-hand side. The right-hand side, kinetic energy dissipated, that's joules as well. So if you work this out, F times 1.3 is a half m v squared, and you'll get a similar value for the force. The assumption, as I hinted at, is that we have a closed system. Just mention it. The assumption is that we have a closed system, i.e. no external forces are acting. In fact, friction would be an external force here. Okay. And so, thank you very much. That's all from me on this particular presentation. I've got another presentation coming up on further momentum. So keep working. Thank you very much.